Oh, hello, it says we're live, so um, anything could happen in the next half hour, as I used to say. Well, I might have said that too quickly. Anyway, if I missed off the hello bit, then hello. Um, it's a good start, isn't it? Okay, um, just kind of getting a feel for this now, so we're trying to see how this goes as a way of um, sort of taking my, my podcast further um, by doing them these as live hangouts. Um see how it goes at the moment it's just me perhaps we'll see if somebody else wants to get involved in the future it might be fun have a have a co-host um and after much thought i think what are we going to talk about really i really want to concentrate on the thing i'm passionate about really which is books so in all its forms so there possibly be some stuff about writing just loads of stuff about reading there may be some stuff about publishing so we'll try and keep that fairly uh, lively and interesting and i'll try and do one a week and we'll see how it goes we'll take it from there um i i'm going to kick off with something about a book which is a a classic book um i hope you can see that kurt vonnegut's um slaughterhouse five um which i'm sure is available for more good bookshops i'll um I'll add some links later on YouTube so you can see where you can get it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I've still got a slight cough, I'm afraid. So what kind of book is it? Well, I picked this up because I'd heard of Vonnegut, and I think probably because um, probably less well-known in the UK to some extent. I'm sure there'll be people who disagree with me, but perhaps um, more at the forefront of people's minds if they're in the USA. Um and I kind of looked at it, I found it in a second-hand bookshop. I thought, why on earth haven't I read this yet? I've, I've heard it, I've seen, you know, inspiring quotes from Bonnie Gutt and so on. But why haven't I read all his books? So I picked it up uh, and I was quite quite enthralled with it, really. It's a really good introduction to Bonnie Gutt. If you haven't read one before, I would guess. I haven't read any more yet. I'm, I'm looking forward to finding out what else he has to offer because um, really quite a nice uh, voice, in the nice sensitive voice, quite an original uh, original thinker I would guess from this this work anyway I wasn't even really sure what it was about um, for those of you who don't know um, I'm perhaps in a minority <laughs> a lot of people probably know what it's about uh, it is partly to do with the uh, the dreadful um, events of the Allied bombing of uh, the German town of Dresden in the Second World War which um, was a quite horrendous event um, which which many many people were killed. I believe more people than the actual the Hiroshima um, bomb. So an incredibly intense uh, firebombing, and Vonnegut was actually there in person. And I can only imagine that's had an in incredibly traumatizing effect on the rest of his entire life. And so too to, the, to his character Billy Pilgrim in this book. Um, he Billy. Pilgrim is a sort of plodding everyman type character who uh, gets thrown into all kinds of situations and his life is lived in a slightly disjointed way. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of little extracts, which I hope is okay with the copyright people. And they're not going to come and sue me or anything, just tiny little bits, just to give you a flavour in a moment in case you haven't read it or perhaps you want to refresh your memory of it. Um, it's interesting to me that as I read this quite quickly, it's it's a fairly it's a fairly slim book, um, but it's it's quite a disjointed book. I it's the character has this idea that he is um, living through time in a different way, going backwards and forwards in time. So, is it a traditional time travel book? I certainly don't think so. Does it? There are aliens and uh, sort of alien abductions in it. I don't think it's a traditional sci-fi book either. It's kind of a one of a kind, really, is all I would say about it. So um, I'll give you a little flavor of it and uh, I should do my best with the readings. I've still got a slight cold, I'm afraid. <clears throat> so excuse me if I have to clear my throat. And I've got to put on my reading glasses. Um, if I ever do things like this, it's quite hard to discuss this book without this, but I really try, I, I just don't believe in giving out spoilers to people. I think if I mention a book, it's because I'd like you to go out and discover it for yourself. I won't bother your time. They won't bother you taking up your time with, with books that aren't worth uh, hunting out. But if 
uh, this is something to, to hunt out and have a rig to, I think. It's certainly uh, something nicely different. And uh, that's, I think, what a lot of us look for. Uh, we probably get sick of generic ho-hum type stuff. So this doesn't fit into a genre particularly. Great, all the better. Um, there are too many things that fit nicely into a genre. Uh, I'm not particularly talking about anybody or criticizing anybody. Traditional publishers have tend to try and sell what is already selling, don't they, of course? So uh, everything seems to be a remix of something else sometimes. So it's nice when you find something like this. It's really worth worth your while to go and get it and read it. So um, I'll just give you a couple of little snippets. <coughs> and I'll jump around a bit as well, just, just so that, you know, I'm not giving anything away. This is actually from Chapter 2 of Slaughterhouse-Five. And although, yes, he's an American writer, and I'll do my best with any dialogue, but I, I read it better if I do it in my own accent. Rather, I, I could try reading it in an American accent, but I think it would probably uh, sound a little bit um, not very genuine, perhaps. <clears throat> Listen, Billy Pilgrim has come unstuck in time. Billy has gone to sleep a senile widower and awakened on his wedding day. He has walked through a door in 1955 and come out another one in 1941. He has gone back through that door to find himself in 1963. He has seen his birth and death many times, he says, and pays random visits to all the events in between, he says. Billy is spastic in time, has no control over where he is going next and the trips aren't necessarily fun. He is in a constant state of stage fright, he says, because he never knows what part of his life he's going to have to act in next. Billy was born in 1922 in Ilium, New York, the only child of a barber there. He was a funny looking child who became a funny looking youth, tall and weak and shaped like a bottle of Coca-Cola. He graduated from Ilium High School in the upper third of his class and attended night sessions at the Ilium School of Optometry for one semester before being drafted for military service in the Second World War. His father died in a hunting accident during the war. So it goes. And that so it goes is a little refrain that Vonnegut uses because um, when people die or are killed in this book it tends to be in a sort of ridiculous senseless and unexpected way and he sort of sums it up by just saying so it goes that's kind of life and you kind of feel drawn into that sense yes that there are huge tragedies and and things that happen in warfare but there are sort of a million other little tragedies that that happen in daily life that sense of that really really came home to me you know that the those little things that happen to perhaps somebody you know, somebody in your family, or maybe somebody who just lives down the road. We're surrounded by these things. So Billy has this strange uh, occurrence that happens to him, and perhaps a modern reader might say something to do with PTSD, where he has this idea of being disjointed in time, that he's living his life all in different order, and, um, and perhaps that's something to do with the way that people who've had traumatic things happen to them often seem to relive parts of their life don't they quite interestingly um, but on the other hand it's a kind of tragic comic thing so there's some very real life things and some really quite funny things in it which you wouldn't expect from what I've said so far perhaps it's about tragic events but some of it really is actually quite funny so I'll give you a little flavor of uh, a bit from later on just later on the same chapter I'll try and say Tralfamadorians, which are you know, uh, Madorians, which are the alien people that he believes he has uh, been abducted by, or perhaps he really has been abducted by and taken away, which is how come he's able to see time in this different way. <clears throat> so. Oh, sorry, I lost my place where I was going to start from. I'm only trying to do little, little snippets, really. Oh, we'll go back a bit. There we are. 
this will help to dis explain it actually. Sorry. Bear with me. <clears throat> so she's starting out with a, a letter that Billy Pilgrim has written. The most important thing I learned on Trial from a Door was that when a person dies, he only appears to die. He's still very much alive in the past, so it is very silly for people to cry at his funeral. All moments, past, present, and future, always have existed, always will exist. The Tralfamadorians can look at all the different moments, just the way we can look at a stretch of the Rocky Mountains, for instance. They can see how permanent all the moments are, and they can look at any moment that interests them. It is just an illusion we have here on Earth that one moment follows another, one like beads on a string, and that once a moment is gone, it is gone forever. When a Tralfamadorian sees a corpse, all he thinks is that the dead person is in bad condition in that particular moment, but that the same person is just fine in plenty of other moments. Now, when I hear myself, sorry, now when I myself hear that somebody's dead, I simply shrug and say what the Tralfamadorians say about dead people, which is, so it goes, and so on. Billy was working on this letter in the basement rumpus room of his empty house. It was his housekeeper's day off. There was an old typewriter in the rumpus room. It was a beast. It weighed as much as a storage battery. Billy couldn't carry it very far very easily, which is why he was writing in the rumpus room instead of somewhere else. The oil burner had quit. A mouse had eaten through the insulation of a wire leading to the thermostat, the temperature in the house was down to 50 degrees, but Billy hadn't noticed. He wasn't warmly dressed either. He was barefoot and still in his pyjamas and a bathrobe, though it was late afternoon. His bare feet were blue and ivory. The cockles of Billy's heart, at any rate, were glowing coals. What made them so hot was Billy's belief that he was going to comfort so many people with the truth about time. His door chimes upstairs had been ringing and ringing. It was his daughter, Barbara, up there, wanting in. Now she let herself in with a key, crossed the floor over his head, calling, Father? Daddy? Where are you? And so on. Billy didn't answer her, so she was nearly hysterical, expecting to find his corpse. And when she looked into the very last place there was to look, which was the rumpus room. I may have misread a word then, so sorry if I uh, caused any confusion. Um, <clears throat> I think I'll probably just stop that reading there for the moment anyway, um, because I don't want to uh, give too much away. But you can kind of see that there's the, the, the quite sort of surreal elements in the, the story. And then there's the very real little, uh, lovely little details and some fantastic use of language. I love the, the way he's body shaped like a Coca-Cola bottle. Um, can't help but smile when you read that. I think it's just such a lovely little description. And just the little things about, um, you know, you, you can really picture it, it, the, the, the big old typewriter. rumpus room or whatever a rumpus room is <laughs> i can kind of guess um so that's been quite an interesting experiment um 
I will um, I will try stopping there. I just saw a thing that said I had a viewer then, they disappeared. So I uh, don't know what that was about. So <laughs> um, I will uh, finish off there. So see how it goes. And I'll try and do some more professional ones as we go on and learn how to do a bit better. So thank you very much if you are watching or listening on YouTube uh, are in the podcast version, which I'll put up on my website at mikeycampling.com. You can always say hi to me via my website there. That's the best place to find me. Um, okay, thank you very much. Oh, I still lost my connection and now I definitely.